يو الف ب ت حروف الابجديه روحي تين الدين في نفس الكلمه ليا العربي بتاعي مكسر بتكلم بالعاميه في السي في مكتوب فلوينت لغه اجنبيه فرنساوي انجليزي اسباني ماليزي صح مش متعود اقرا الترجمه يا عزيزي سهل ايزي اصلا انا تلميزي بوظت نفسي بنفسي خطتي تنفيذي العربي بقى فرانكو موبيل بقت اورنج بعبر عني بالغربي انا من الناس دولة متعود من صغري محدش يجي يقولي اقرا الفرنانة واسمع انت عمري شكل عندي مشكلة دماغي ملوثة ما اتعلمتش عربي والعيب على المدرسة دي مش هالوسينيشن دي اسمها هلوسة رخمت الجامعة مسحوا العربي بالمكنسة كوت جاية من قطع القهوة بقت كوفي اخترعنا الكيكة وهم طلعوا بالموفن طقنا كلمة سفاري خلوها ابلكيشن اخترعنا الشطرنج خلوه بلاي ستيشن اه حتى الراب جاي من الشعر مش هقول تاني فرق هقول فعل مش اي بي سي لا حرف ب ت لا الفعل والفعل والمفعول ب لغة الدار بالعربي سمعني وريني ما تنفرش العربي الاصل الباقي صيني لازم تختار كلامك يبقى بلغة واحدة مهما نفذت ودرت العالم بالعربي احلى بالعربي احلى Hello and welcome to AC TV. This is Ahmed Rifai with a special episode of the show. Today we're talking about an issue which affects many of us who attend liberal arts institutions like AUC. Western culture has become arguably a bigger part of our lives than our own culture. Our choice of food, clothing, and entertainment are a testament to how deeply culturally imperialized we are. I would like to welcome the studio two integrated marketing communication majors. Uh, graduating seniors whose graduation project addresses and attempts to curb this very phenomenon. Dalia Bushedi, welcome. And Lina Sharif, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, first, I want to congratulate you on being awarded the best national cause after your presentation. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit, very generally, about the idea behind your campaign and why you chose this specific topic. Okay, so firstly, our campaign is called Bilarabi Ahla or the Arabic language initiative. Uh, the reason why we chose it is because we noticed that um, all around us in our society, especially in Egypt, um, a lot of people prefer speaking English and it's seen as something more uh, elitist, more, it makes you look better when you speak uh, foreign languages as opposed to speaking Arabic, um, which is very contradictory. Uh, so for example, when you go to other countries like Germany, like, in, like um, France, if you speak to them in English, they'll probably reply to you in German or in French. So in Egypt here, it's the exact opposite. They would more like to answer you in, in English or whatever foreign language it is. And um, so what we were concerned about is that future generations, uh, as they grow up, uh, they're not going to even be able to, uh, to read a Fusha book or you know, com communicate by writing in Arabic properly, etc. Like if you can see the kids nowadays um, that attend private and international schools, um, they pretty much only speak uh, English. So um, this is something we wanted to target because we don't want the Arabic language to deteriorate over time. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the eye-opening factors is uh, something that I uh, personally saw. I visited the, <laughs> the um, Khargeya. Ministry of Foreign the Ministry of Foreign Affairs yeah. and they told me that um, AUCNs are more than qualified to um, apply for the Khargeya but because of the exam uh, there's an Arabic language section because of this exam over 90% of AUCNs fail and it's just because of Arabic is that what is that what how you started this idea behind behind your uh, behind your initiative it was just one of the one of the things that one triggered of the, the... One of the factors. You felt yeah. like your own Arabic language is, is not the greatest. Yeah, even though it, like, we all are Egyptians, we all live in Egypt, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so... Oh, uh, well, I want to apologize right <laughs> off the bat that we're conducting this interview in English. I hope our viewers don't find this a bit contradictory. But um, you must have presented your, uh, your presentation in, in English as well because it's a, it's, a, it's a class at AUC. So how do you... How, why do you think that is? What are the roots of this problem? And are you trying to, ch are you trying to change mm -hmm. that? Excuse me. Actually, we presented in Arabic, not in English, which was very challenging. 
We think the root of the problem lies in the education system in Egypt, because especially in private universities and schools, because they, fa they focus mainly on uh, teaching students foreign languages rather than the Arabic language, which is a problem because they associate the Arabic language with being outdated, not trendy anymore, and they just don't use it as much anymore. And they teach students foreign languages because they associate it with being more elite and they perceive students who talk in other languages as being more educated. So that's the thing we're trying to change. We want Arabic to be more trendy and not outdated and cool. And we want everyone to use it, basically. <laughs> Did you get yeah. permission from the department, as, as, like a special kind of permission to, to present in Arabic? Or no, was that they always were very allowed? welcoming. No, they were very they, understanding. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense yeah. because the nature of your topic yes. has yeah. to have you speaking in Arabic. That yeah. does make sense. But this, yeah. this sounds to me almost like it's a problem that is centric towards um, like the elite social class in Egypt. So that yes. would probably not be the case with maybe less fortunate, less privileged people in the country. It actually might be the opposite. If you start speaking in English with, I don't want to sound classes, but like if, if you're trying yeah, to speak yeah, in English yeah. with like a microbus driver, he'll like, he'll brush you off as like, he'll make fun of you or whatever. So is that is that the kind of the strata of society that you were tackling or you were trying to engage with? Exactly. We're targeting students in private universities and private schools and we're targeting young parents who are fresh graduates from private uh, schools or universities mm -hmm. uh, because they are the people who were taught everything in foreign languages. They were the ones whom their school did not really focus on teaching them more Arabic and usually uh, in um, international schools especially uh, they just take like one class per week and uh, of Arabic language and it's very they do not even focus on it it's something that's not important they just want to pass they just want to graduate mm -hmm. and they don't really care about the Arabic they just take it basically to graduate so yeah and that's the class we're targeting great um, Dalia I want to ask you a bit about the process you went through um, where did you shoot? Who did you interview? What were the components sort of of your uh, of your project? Okay, so um, firstly, one of the most successful things we did in our campaign was uh, this music video. Um, it's a music video, an official song for Bil Arabi Ahla. Uh, we we made it into a rap song in order for it to resonate with the youth, <laughs> and um, we shot in different areas. We went to uh, Shar Al Muaz and um, uh, we went to a friend's Fantastic. house mm -hmm. just to shoot like a homey setting mm -hmm. and um, the song was, was definitely in Arabic I assume yes it was in <laughs> Arabic of course but it was taken from the perspective of someone who was who is in our shoes so mm -hmm. it was someone who is exposed to the educational system we have speaks English most of the time etc and um, yeah, feel free to listen to it uh, on our Facebook page. <laughs> of course. Actually, it and got 16k views in like two days yeah. and it went viral and we're very proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you have any kind of sort of uh, publicity for your, for, for your uh, social media presence or? Yes, we, um, we did most, pretty much social, the social media part was our base for everything. Yeah. So um, a lot of our um, activations, we did booths in schools and university and everything that we did was posted on there. We also got a lot of influencers, um, like figures uh, known in Egypt. So Zap Tharwat, who's a rapper, mm -hmm. he raps in Arabic. Um, he supported our campaign and uh, sent a message uh, through, uh, so and we posted it on social media. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with Dr. Azat Abouf. Um, we managed to um, get a video with him. He was sending out a message to mainly the parents, mm -hmm. um, that they should uh, consider Arabic when they put their children into schools, etc. And um, yeah, he supported our campaign as well. So that is great. Yeah. But let me ask you about what kind of change you're trying to institute. What actual kind of are you trying to maybe change the public school curriculums or have like a have parents change their mindset about teaching their children Arabic? What is the actual change that you're trying to incorporate? Okay, so the first core change that we want is a behavioral change. Mm -hmm. We want um, the youth to, firstly, we want to spark an interest in Arabic f 
for them. So we want them to know about the language more, to feel that they want to speak it and learn it by themselves, not that it's forced upon them. And then secondly, we want, we want to look at all the influencers in our target audience's lives. So this includes parents, it includes the schools, it on the long term includes the government, uh, etc. So uh, this is what we want to do. So the schools, we want them to lobby for more Arabic or if they can't add it into the curriculum, we recommended uh, extracurricular activities, uh, an Arabic reading club, an Arabic debate club. So you're trying to create change from the bottom up, sort of. Yeah, exactly. You're not trying to address like government uh, policy. That's not really what you're focusing we on. We actually, no, it's part of the focus, but it's way on the long term. But we actually did try. We managed to contact the Minister of Education, Dr. Tar Tariq Shawi. Mm -hmm. um, however, we did not have the chance to fully discuss our ideas completely. But um, the idea is um, mainly that we need to lobby first along with the private schools and the international schools and the parents who would put pressure on the schools in order to appeal to the ministry. It's a long process. Yeah. <laughs> change. Um, I want to ask you one last question. How was the reception of your campaign and what were some of the most challenging obstacles that you faced? Okay. Um, we think we made great publicity on Facebook because everyone was talking about the campaign, even our friends from Qatar, and it went in, uh, like somehow international. And uh, the challenges we faced, the main challenge we faced was that we had to translate all the terminologies we learned from the beginning of the semester in Arabic in a very small time frame. And the idea of presenting in Arabic was really challenging for us <laughs> without integrating like um, any other uh, words from another language because we had we cannot like contradict our cause or our, our yeah, initiative so it was pretty challenging it was very challenging as well to um, to like decide on the target audience because we don't want it to be too big for us to in order to be more concise and mm -hmm. deliver the message more like accurately and in a better way uh, so we decided to target uh, mainly the youth and like young parents or people who are like gonna be parents anytime soon. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, I would like to thank you both, Dalia and Lena, for your time. It was great having you, you on the show. Uh, other members, other another two members of your group will actually be joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, we have a short interview with Professor uh, Rasha Lem, Professor of Arabic Reporting here in AUC. Thank you again, Dalia and Nina, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Rasha Alem. How are you? Uh, I'm good, thank you. Uh, can you tell us, in your opinion, how does cultural imperialism affect our Arabic language? This is a very good question. Um, but um, I don't think that it is only the phenomenon or um, we should not only limit the um, issue of the Arabic language or that the youth are not encouraged to um, write in Arabic due to culture imperialism. Maybe this is only part of the problem, but I think we can take it to an earlier stage and how Arabic is taught in schools this is the first thing. The second is how do parents encourage their students and make it a priority for them to talk in Arabic. If we try to put some effort in these two parts, I think that we will um, start to have generations who are um, uh, more confident in their Arabic language and who are uh, more willing and happy and proud to talk uh, their language. You are teaching Arabic in the Arabic section of the caravan. So can you tell us how do your students perform and what obstacles do they face? Okay, let me tell you something. Um, students, sometimes they are afraid Okay, they, they, they know, and later on they, they know that they can or that they are able to talk and write in Arabic. 
okay? What we face at the beginning, that we, that, that we, um, we need to break this fear and encourage them to uh, participate and um, uh, put their voices and their language on papers. Uh, this is one of the issues that we face, but let me tell you something, that students have a great potential in writing mm -hmm. in, uh, in Arabic. Uh, especially, um, I, I, we found that many of them, they are willing to give it a try, especially when they know that the market, um, uh, the media market, um, is growing and we now have uh, many websites that are uh, launched in the Arabic language. Sometimes when they graduate, they only find places when they have to um, write in Arabic. Even if they started to work in foreign uh, media institutions, they have to conduct their interviews in Arabic from, um, when they understand the, the market and how does the market wor work, they start to put their Yani their input and they found that we found that they have done a great, uh, great job. What suggestions do you have to solve the issue of the Arabic language? And how can we bring people back to speak the Arabic language? As I told you, it should start from the beginning. We cannot solve this issue uh, when um, uh, they start to get enrolled at AUC. They, it has to start from their childhood. We have to encourage our kids to master the language of Arab the Arabic language because it is their language. Um, uh, we have to talk about the origins of the to talk to them about the origins of the Arabic language and how um, uh, how profound it is. Um, then um, here as mass com journalism and mass communication department, we started to introduce topics and we started to have minors in Arabic to encourage our students because this is what we found that the, the, what the market needs. The market needs people who are very fluent in English and who can also write good Arabic. This is what the market needs. So we start to tailor programs according to the needs of the market. But they, when, they, when they understand this, I think this is part of the um, um, that, that would solve the problem when they understand this and at the same time when they find courses offered to them to um, um, make them better in whether uh, in, um, um, in speaking or in writing. Thank you so much Dr. Rasha. It was a pleasure to have you. Welcome back to ACTV. I have with me in studio um, two other members of the Arabic language initiatives. I have with me Dina Amir, Hi. a graduating IMC major, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and Sandy Philip, Hi. Uh, welcome to the show, also a graduating IMC major. Um, I want to ask you real quick, what were some of the most exciting parts in working on your project? Well, it was kind of feeling that you have a national cause and if you, which is actually the the award that we got yesterday best national cause congratulations on thank that. you so much and feeling that you're touching a part where it, like people have been noticing it but no one have worked about like on it before it's kind of a new thing to the people and they don't actually face it they don't face the problem and we're like living in a bubble where everyone is acting but no one is, is actually like standing for a moment and, and thinking about the consequences of what's going to happen next. It's, it was very challenging actually to tell people that you actually, or most of the people that we were targeting, that some people speak English because they look up at the class we're targeting, feeling that speaking English will make you look more prestigious. But the thing is, is when time goes and like years, years after that, people will, might forget Arabic. I will say they will. Mm -hmm. They might forget Arabic and our identity will go with it. And that's our problem. Um, your, your colleagues have highlighted this, uh, this notion that speaking English is more prestigious or it's more classy. Um, do you think that is definitely a, just a part of our elite culture? It's not 
it's not ingrained as much in other stratas of society, is that correct? Yeah, but we're targeting not only A class, it's A and B classes. And the problem is how A and B classes are acting affects the C and D classes. Which means that when I talk English most of the time intentionally, that I should be talking English to raise my kids or even as a student to feel good about myself and okay, I know how to speak English fluently. The other, un unless like classes would imitate me to feel that they belong more to the higher classes and that's the problem. And that's why we started with A and B classes, not the lower classes. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that they will be imitating us and here comes the problem that we lose our identity and so is them. Uh, would you say this, uh, uh, Sandy, I want to ask you, did, mm -hmm. would you say this would contribute to, like, some, some people say that this kind of phenomenon encourages maybe um, the elite in society to travel to other countries, that the phenomenon known as brain drain, would you say that this might be a cause or this might be something that you were trying to battle for people to have faith uh, in their culture to stay in Egypt is that is that something that you were trying to touch on so our aim is um, was not to tell people that English is not the, the language that they should not speak with our aim was that we wanted people to to speak their their own language mm -hmm. to feel that how rich Arabic is because this this what represents our identity we didn't want to know you should for example, uh, learn uh, your all your courses with Arabic language. Mm -hmm. we, we don't say this because actually we yani, we are part of this, uh, and we, all all the things we 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 take are in in English. Mm -hmm. So that's not our aim. Our aim is to feel how rich the language is and how it represents our our, our culture, and to yeah, you yani, need to feel <laughs> how it's. Uh, it represents us. Yes, I <laughs> um, but some people would say that the language itself has has a direct effect on has like more of a societal societal impact. So if you're if you're um, watching English TV shows, if you if you communicate in English, that will kind of have an effect on your greater personality. Mm, definitely. So is that something that you were trying to also like to address? The problem is that since we are watching uh, movies in English and all that, we're more attached with the, the, the Western culture. And this made a huge gap between our generation and the Arabic language, which mm -hmm. also make us not attached, make, made us detached from our identity. And we're more um, imitating the other, uh, the other culture and mm -hmm. in all our lifestyles and behaviors. Even the music we listen to are mostly in English or French or whatever. We, we don't really listen in any, we're like very detached from our uh, culture. So that's our problem. That is very true. But mm -hmm. I've, I've noticed, and Dina, I want to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that you seem to put the blame kind of solely on the members of society who exhibit this kind of behavior as opposed to on the culture itself, that that might be a tricky subject to talk about, but wouldn't you say that maybe the culture itself might be to blame? Just a little. Well, actually we tried to contact the Mr. Uh, Minister of Education because we believe that the Arabic curriculum in schools that was taught to the kids and even to us, international schools or whatever, it was kind of boring when you compare it to English. It was always dull or the topics were not actually beneficial. Mm -hmm. So we were raised perceiving Arabic, I'd say, as a, bo a boring thing or maybe a very complicated thing that you wouldn't benefit from. You just have to learn it and memorize so you can go and, and do good in your exam. Mm -hmm. And that's the main problem. So we also targeted the Ministry uh, of Education and we also talked to the people. So I guess we went or we tried as much as possible to go on two parallel levels so we can solve the problem. It's very very broad and it's not easy to target all or tackle all the stakeholders of the issue at the same time but we tried our best i think um we actually went around campus and asked students about um, their thoughts on reviving the arabic language 
We uh, ask them some fun questions to see what their proficiency is when it comes to Arabic. Uh, do you want to take a little, quick look at that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. All right. Hi, Ahmed. We're now in the plaza uh, trying to seek uh, what students know about the Arabic language as opposed to the cultural imperialism we've been discussing. So uh, stay with us to uh, ask the students. Do you know what Arkala and Murawaga mean? Arkala? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Arkala was Murawaga and manipulative. Arkala means like an obstacle or an obstacle to a person in a Murawaga maybe deceiving. أو حاجة كده عرقلة يكابل أظن مروغة يعني فليرتنج أظن عرقلة تهيألي يعني يعني ما حد يكون بتلكع أو بطء أو كده مروغة يعني اثنين بيجروا ورا بعض أو مجادلة أو اشتباك مثلا كعبلة يعني إن حد بي بي بيتكعبل يعني في الأرض ومروغة دي مش فاكرة قوي بس غالبا ايه بيجادل مع حد او بيدسكاس حاجه يعني عرقله لا ما اعرفش يعني ايه عرقله وخيمه يعني حاجه وحشه يعني اخر مره كتبت حاجه بالعربي ممكن من يومين مثلا انا بكتب لصاحبي كل سنه وهو طيب بكتبها له بالعربي فبكتبها على الفيسبوك بيج يعني بالعربي يعني بن بن بنكتب الحاجه وبعدين بنفتح جوجل عشان تشيك ان الكلام مكتوب بطريقه صح عشان ما حدش يسف علينا ويلكم باك um, I wouldn't say I'm surprised by the reactions and the answers of, of the people who are tested on their proficiency in Arabic. I think that is that touches well on what you were trying to what you were trying to tackle with your project. Um, I want to ask you finally, uh, what is your plan um, for the project after you graduate? Are you still going to be working on this on this project? How how attached are you going to be? To uh, the yes, project? I feel like yeah, we yeah, we definitely want to continue what we started. Uh, actually, uh, many people were very excited for yesterday for our cause. Uh, one of the judges actually told us that we can make a cooperation with maybe Coca-Cola or something, that Coca-Cola, Ahla Bil Arabi, something like that. Uh, so many people were very excited about it. And actually, uh, one of the members here in the TAFL uh, program, the teaching Arabic as a foreign language, speak, speak with us, spoke with us. <laughs> and she told us that she's very excited about it. And she wants to be, um, yani, she wants us to, uh, to, make, yani, to make students here aware more about this and that the Arabic is very important, not only English. Yeah. So you, you're definitely not going to lose interest in the, in the definitely. project after you graduate. That is, that is very great to hear. It was very nice to hear. Um, thank you both, Dina thank and you. Sandy. It was great thank having you. you on the show. Uh, next segment, we have uh, an interview with up and coming uh, artist and singer, Nisma Mahboub. Uh, we asked her some questions that relate to your topic, about, but especially about art and music in Egypt. So thank you again, Dina and Sandy. Thank you. So today we're having uh, Nisma Mahboub, uh, who will be talking with us about cultural imperialism and music role in uh, cultural imperialism. Uh, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, first uh, of all, I want to ask you about how do you <coughs> think uh, music play a role in cultural imperialism? Okay, so um, in the era that we're living in right now, um, Egypt has started losing a lot of its identity, not only in music, but in many other aspects. Yani. So um, if, if I'm talking specifically about music, our music is not really, uh, does not sound Egyptian, mostly. Uh, we use uh, instruments that, are, that came from the Western world. Uh, we tend to imitate uh, Western singing, um, especially in our Arabic songs, um, and that's why we're kind of losing in our identity in music specifically. Uh, here in AUC, we teach um, uh, classical, we teach Arabic, and we teach, like this semester, we started teaching pop and, and rock, and for singing specifically. Uh, we have all the instruments, most, not all of them, but many instruments to teach as well, Western and Arabic. Um, but again, 
uh, most of the people here in AUC, they tend to sing in English, mm -hmm. not in Arabic. Um, some of them are more Arabic oriented, but these are very few. And uh, here in my class, I teach a performance class. Talking like uh, you said that uh, Le Miserable uh, touched the people and they were uh, inspired by it. How can we invest more in such uh, uh, musical theaters to make them more in Arabic? Uh, well, we just, it's either people, yeah, it's, it's all about having the production mm -hmm. actually. It's, it, um, that, that someone uh, uh, risks to put their money in, in musical theater. Mm -hmm. And and this doesn't happen frequently, uh, so if 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 producers take that risk, more people will start writing to that new genre, and then more people will 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 come and, and try out because mm -hmm. people who like to stand on stage, it would be wonderful for them to do all three disciplines together, like singing, acting, and dancing. Okay. So that's a that's a totally different world for 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 music. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we, we just need people who, decision makers, to, to be more risky with that. Mm -hmm. And actually, audiences love new and, and, uh, and valuable music. Like, they, they, they really love to go to, um, to a musical, I think. Because Egypt, uh, uh, in the 50s and in the 40s and the 60s, all our uh, uh, film industry was full of songs, mm -hmm. and we had many sketches, and, and they, they looked like musicals. But then we lost it somehow, and, and we started to get more westernized. Mm -hmm. And then now we're trying to get it back again on track. We hope for a better future for the Arabic Hopefully. language and it comes Hopefully. back. Uh, Desma, thank you so much. Thank you. It was thank a you pleasure much. having you. Thank you. It is apparent that the influence of Western culture runs deep in our own culture, whether it be in art, academia, or entertainment. Reversing this process might not be easy, but its mere recognition could be an aid in curbing its continuation. Thank you for watching AUC TV. I'm Ahmed Rifai. See you next time.